so, jetzt Dorfhörer. Uh, now we'll present Dr. Luca Braga from ICGB. He is a group leader from uh, functional cell biology. And uh, uh, next one uh, will be me. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Okay. So first, uh, I would really like to thank all the organizers for uh, inviting me and for uh, really doing this amazing job in uh, preparing this very, very interesting uh, uh, meeting. So um, today, I, I will uh, I split my presentation into, let's say, three main parts. One is just to, to give you an idea of uh, the way that we are approaching science. The other one is uh, mainly focused on uh, what do we offer to our collaborators. So this is uh, uh, meant to, to establishing also further collaboration between uh, Moldovian scientists and ICGB. And the third part is more about uh, where we are going and what we are doing in my laboratory. So uh, I, I always like to start uh, uh, my presentation with this uh, uh, set of slides. So uh, how do we approach a biological problem? No? So th th this looks like a, a silly question, maybe or too general, but is really uh, on topic. And so th the normal way to do that uh, is uh, by using the, what I call the biochemist approach. So it's what is based on educated guesses. So you have an idea, you have an hypothesis uh, that is based on what is known, what is available in literature. Then you go to the lab, you do your experiment, and you can say, yes, it's confirmed, no, it's neglected. Then you go back again in literature, and this is an iterative cycle of research. Obviously, it's very solid, but uh, uh, it's slow, okay? So in the last years, we have seen the rise of uh, what uh, I like to call the photographer approach. So imagine that you can take a picture of a beautiful landscape with a very, very wide angle lens. So you can see all what's going on, but it's very difficult then to go into details and to know uh, who is doing what. This is uh, genomic transcriptomic, proteomic, so you can have the full image of what's going on in your cell of, of interest, in your disease, but then who is the relevant pay player? Who is causing that disease? That's very hard to understand. To do that, uh, we decided to go for the functional approach. So the idea, it is to first screening for function. Can we identify who are the set of genes or the gene that causes that disease, that causes that phenotype? So this is nothing new, it's not something that we invented. So you have to think that uh, back in 1982, the first time in which uh, uh, scientists identified uh, uh, human oncogenes, the approach was exactly the same, but with, with uh, much less automation, much less technology. Most recently, uh, in 2012, with the Nobel Prize in Medicine by Shinya uh, Yamanaka, exactly the same approach. So they took a collection of genes and they said, which set of genes can reprogram any cell of our body into an induced pluripotent stem cells? They did all the combination and they find four of them. So this is what we call functional biology and functional approach in science. Obviously, uh, you can combine this type of approaches in a very flexible manner. So what are we doing? Basically, we are screening collections of molecules drugs, RNA, and what is the aim? Identify new biotherapeuticals for human diseases. What are the collections that we have available? Drugs, and mainly, mainly FDA and EMA approved drugs. So this is for drug repurposing screenings. Or non-coding RNA, so collections of uh, microRNA, siRNA, so to switch on and off genes, and uh, all the other kind of RNAs that can uh, get up to your mind. How do we measure the phenotypic changes that we impose in these screenings? We have two main platforms, microscopy and uh, biochemical assay. By microscopy, that is really the cutting edge technology that we have available in, uh, in our uh, setup, you can actually take a picture of cells, either live or fixed, and see how that drug or that uh, genetic piece of material is changing the shape, the proliferation, and the properties of these cells. How does it work, uh, the, the, the screening workflow, so how you d design this type of experiment and why 
I'm showing this to you, because we can offer to our collaborators to enter at different stages into this process. So the first thing, it is uh, study the underlying biology. So what is the biological question that you want to address through this experiment? And, uh, and obviously, this is something that comes from our collaborators. So they come to us with the question. We have this biological question. Can we use your technology to address it? Then the second step, it is, it is to design the assay and optimize it. So can we use the assay that you were using in your laboratory to run a screening for 20,000 molecules? And uh, this is something that uh, uh, either the scientists that are coming are doing, or we can help them to do that in our laboratories. The second test, uh, it is to test the screening condition that you identified. And obviously, this can lead you to, yes, it works, we can go on, or no, we have to go back and change our setup. And this is something that we are very good in doing, and we can help people coming to ICGB to do that in their own uh, um, uh, let's say in their own project. Then we validate the assay. So we say, okay, do we have a positive or a negative control? How this is working? Yes, it works. We can induce this level of effect, and we are looking for things that are working two, three, four times uh, better. And then uh, uh, we run the screening for them. So we have all the capability to do automated high throughput screening. And our collaborators can go back to their own laboratory with a list of hits and then go on with further characterization or validation in their own model of interest. This is the type of pipeline that we have in place in ICGB. So it relies on a, a mid to high grade of automation. And uh, in particular, we can offer to our collaborator the preparation of library. So we have all these type of libraries, so we have uh, uh, mouse whole genome sRNA library. So it means that we have a collection of plates in which in each well there is a pool of sRNA that can silence every gene in the human and mouse gene. Uh, then we have the same for microRNA, overexpression and silencing, and then we have collection of drugs that are used for other uh, purposes. The services that we offer are basically replicate library, uh, but in particular also uh, prepare custom libraries. So. Do you have an idea? Do you have a project in which you want uh, to test uh, 1,000 genes? There is no need to test all 20,000. We can build up for you a 1,000 gene library, and then you can run the screening only on this specific uh, collection. Why is this important? I am mainly working with primary cells, and to isolate uh, a million of cells, uh, you may need uh, 10 animals. And so the possibility to screen very Selected hits is very important because it can limit the cost and the feasibility of the and increase the feasibility of the approach. Then, uh, in regards to image acquisition, we implemented uh, a very nice pipeline because you have to think that uh, you run a screening, you have uh, 20,000 uh, genes to screen. It means that you end up with uh, more than 2 million images to deal with. And the nomenclature that the microscope attributes to them is not very, as you can see, uh, easy to understand. It's a string of code. So we implemented uh, a system in which we can rename automated images. We can uh, uh, merge images into a full, uh, all the channels into a single image in a way that we can increase the accessibility to this data uh, by our collaborators. Not going on? OK. But the, the, the really important question is, uh, once we get an image of a phenotype, how do we transform this information that is purely qualitative into something that is quantitative? So how can we rank the best effective drug, the best effective gene? To do that, we implemented a pipeline for image processing and image analysis, in which basically we can uh, split the image into each channel, and each channel corresponds, each color corresponds to one parameter that you can measure simultaneously in that well. So we are able to count nuclei, we are able to then define the morphology of these nuclei, select the one that are healthy, exclude the one that we know have a shape that corresponds to apoptosis, then we can select the population of the healthy one, define the cytoplasm, measure the parameters of the cytoplasm, how the texture of the staining that you have uh, is affected by the treatment, select the target cells that we want to study further, and we can go on like this, like that, building up data sets with subpopulation, and in each population we can uh, measure specific parameters. 
If you think about that, what is the difference between an approach like this or just uh, lysing the cells and measuring a transcriptome, like we said in the beginning? This is the level of a single cell analysis, because you can see in each cell that you can discriminate by others through a marker what is the effect of your selected compound. So it's like running single cell sequencing, but image-based, so you can see what the cells are doing. Then uh, we can offer, because this is the output of our analysis, no? so you have a barcode with the plate, uh, all the numbers that the machine has measured. We can help our collaborators in mining this data and uh, understand uh, who are uh, the uh, best hit. Uh, does it work? Eh? <laughs> this is the question that uh, lots of people uh, raise because uh, it looks everything very fancy, but how is it complicated? Can it deliver very good science or not? In my experience, I would say yes. This is the type of application that we can reach uh, through this type of approach. So as you can see, they are all, all uh, very high impact uh, journal and studies. What are we doing in my laboratory right now? So uh, I moved uh, my focus from cardiovascular diseases into uh, respiratory diseases. And in particular, we are focused on uh, can we find uh, new biotherapeuticals to regenerate uh, uh, damaged lungs? And uh, just to have an idea, uh, in this moment, uh, the, the, the market for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this is a disease in which basically your lungs are completely fibrotic and you can't breathe anymore. So you need to have oxygen therapy. Four or five years, lung transplant, either you die. So it's a very severe disease. All the treatments that are available right now, I don't have the pointer, are only antifibrotic treatment. So they can only slow down the disease. And there is no way to cure, really, this disease. But this market is growing uh, at a very high rate. And it is estimated to be like $4.2 billion by 2030. So it's really an expanding market. So we said, can we develop regenerative therapies for this type of disease? So rather than slowing down the fibrosis that is just giving you more time, can we make your lungs really better by the end of, uh, of the treatment? And so we said, can we use the, the, the functional approach to do that or not? And the reply was yes. So what we did was, first uh, we dedicated almost a year to understand how we could isolate the primary lung epithelial cells from the mice and put them in culture and have them healthy for a few days. Then we said, uh, if we want to promote uh, a regenerative process, we need to find uh, very pleiotropic agents, so something that targets multiple pathways in a cell in the same moment. And the best uh, molecules in doing that are microRNAs, because they have multiple targets from one uh, uh, molecule. We took all the microRNAs in human genome, so around 2,000, and we tested them individually. So we have this type of plate. In each plate, you have uh, like 384 different uh, microRNAs plus all the controls. And we did this experiment for all 2042. So you see here, I can't disclose with you the, the, the name of the microRNA yet because we didn't patent it, but the red is the amount of healthy cells that you have. So the non-targeting microRNA, anti-Mirna, the first one, is a control, so untreated cells. This MIR200C is, was the best microRNA known to promote this process. You see the effect is very mild. And that, where you see all red, is the microRNA that we spot by this approach. So, even uh, in this case, this is a very good example that uh, we could have started back in literature saying, OK, we know that this pathway is modulating uh, this process, so let's see if we can find uh, a gene that belongs to this pathway. No. We went unbiased, and we picked one that was increasing the ability of this transdifferentiation process by 12-fold. So it's really uh, impressive as a result. Now, obviously, we need to move this into preclinical uh, experimentation. We need to find partners to develop it, so it's not that uh, we found the cure. But this is just an example of how you can target a disease that has no treatment right now to, uh, with this type of approach. So what do we offer to our scientific network? So we have more than 14 years of experience in the field of high throughput screening. We can offer access to very large libraries, up to 20,000 molecules. We offer library formatting services, so we can uh, tell to our partners, we can build up custom libraries for you. We do custom assay development service. So do you have an idea? Do you have an assay? You don't know how to develop it in a way that can be used for this purpose? We can help you in doing that. 
We offer high throughput imaging service, so we have cutting edge confocal fluorescent microscope for high throughput uh, imaging, and also we can offer service for image processing and uh, analysis. What is next? So where we are trying to bring this technology? I, I was really pleased to, to, to hear uh, so many talk on uh, in artificial intelligence in the morning, because uh, this is also where we want to go. First, uh, we want to move our assays from uh, uh, monolayers to organoids. So we believe that uh, if you want to find effective treatment, you have to stop treating one cell type at a time. So since we have the technology to label cells and discriminate who is who, let's try to move into organoids. It's not easy. They are not available for all diseases. We are now starting with cancer organoids. The imaging is much more complex because you have spheres, so you have to go in 3D. It's another level of complexity. And uh, the capability in terms of hardware that you need to analyze this type of experiments is higher. Second, we are trying to move uh, the high-throughput screening technology into uh, biosafety level 3 containment. So the idea it is to be able to screen with live pathogens of unknown uh, uh, origin. And this hopefully should be ready in a couple of years. And uh, we are trying to develop AI-based uh, imaging processing pipeline. So the idea is, when you analyze images, you always start uh, with the guess. That is uh, why you did this experiment. I want to see how this parameter is changing. But maybe that parameter that you are following is not the most informative out of all the one that you can measure. So our idea it is, can we somehow paint cells for random markers like cytoskeletal protein, membrane, channels, nuclear structure, and see if by an AI-based method we can select parameters that are the most effective in discriminating uh, uh, the phenotype of interest. So I'm very happy if you have any question. If uh, you don't have now, no problem. These are my contacts, so you can write me and uh, we can discuss it uh, uh, further. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. So uh, uh, the, this is a very uh, relevant question. We are also working into that direction. Uh, right now, we are mainly working with uh, genetic uh, reporters or uh, uh, immunofluorescence-based staining. So there, the limitation is also the capability of the instrument, but in particular is the availability of secondary antibodies. For example, you don't have infinite host. So in this moment, we can multiplex uh, only five parameters at the time, so it's not uh, high. But the number of features that you can measure with each parameter is very high. So imagine that just with the staining of the cytoplasm, I can export up to 200 features, morphological features per cell. And I have, in average, 18,000 cells per well. So just as the, for example, is the number of indentation, how flat is the cell, uh, how spread it is, uh, how the horizontal versus vertical axis are oriented, uh, how, where is positioned the nucleus, no? so all these type of parameters. And uh, we are also working uh, to find a way that we can use to stain uh, for molecules without using antibodies. So we are trying to move into ISH, into RNA-based uh, um, uh, detection. So we're trying to multiplex it in a way that we can get, obviously, as much information as possible. Another thing that we are trying to do it is to basically, in parallel, uh, run uh, image-based screening versus other type of omic screenings. So when we run the experiment, we run it in parallel. And on one hand, you do image. On the other one, you can do transcriptome, proteome. And in this way, you can even uh, integrate it uh, further. No, not at the single cell level. Uh, thank you, Lucas, for saving our five minutes uh, towards the lunch time, because we need to rush on that. And I hope uh, Mikhail Todiras uh, will be even more effective on that. So, Mikhail, please. Thank you very much. So, let's go.
Dear participants of the meeting, uh, I was thinking, what should I present on this strategy to scale Nikolai Testimitsano State University? And then I decided to start with our strategy, which was launched two years ago. Already it's the second year of the running of this strategy. And this strategy has a very nice motto, education through the research. So, actually, starting with September 2020, we also uh, found the National Institute of the Research and uh, Medicine and Health, which Nikola, with Nikolai Testimitsano State University. And the basic objective is to transform the research of infrastructure into, into contemporary one. Uh, I will come back to that slide, but now I show the uh, actually organigram of the institute. And you see here the faculties which will involve students even until the student circles. But also the research department, the biomedical and health research center, and also the biggest uh, PhD school in the country. We have around 400 students, PhD students, uh, studying in our PhD school. I came back to that. Uh, slide and I'm showing that the general objective number two of uh, this strategy is to modify the current research infrastructure. For that objective we decide to reorganize the infrastructure and to rebuild the central uh, uh, the central um, uh, laboratory building to rebuild it and uh, to reorganize animal facility house, to organize population biobanking, and also other uh, points. Here it's our uh, central laboratory building, which really made a history of the, our in university, uh, 40 years ago, because in that time our university was on the fourth, fifth rank in the Soviet Union. And this center was specialized for some really the uh, uh, big project from the Soviet Union. Uh, we did the uh, feasibility study. Already feasibility study, uh, it uh, was proved, the project was proved, and now we start to implement that. The project is in the mayor of the city, and uh, we are waiting approval. Here will be construct, built another building in front, and like this we will give to this building, we will give uh, another aspect, but uh, will be also the clinical building, uh, which will uh, involve uh, inpatient uh, studies. Now, I will show you another project which already started to run. We got the financing one month ago. That will be integration of the education process with the research one. So, we will open a laboratory, actually a molecular medical medicine center, uh, and uh, uh, let's say 
and the uh, teaching building where uh, all um, basic um, departments uh, teach the students. So, sorry. What we'll have here, we suppose here to have, uh, okay, uh, I cannot show, I don't know why it doesn't work, but okay. Here we'll have cell culture rooms, morphology, biochemistry, genetics, immunology, and finishing with microscope, uh, with confocal microscopy. Now I'll talk about the Health and Biomedical Research Center. So, actually in this center we have five smaller centers. And uh, also we have Biobank, Animal House Facility, and uh, other uh, uh, components. But it's uh, important to mention that they are 24 research laboratories, and today are in progress, are in progress 49 research projects. 33 are funded by, by national budget from National Agency of Research and Development, and 16 are from international grants. Here, just I show you what is doing the Laboratory of the Tissue Engineering and Cells, headed by Professor Naku. Uh, actually, they are using amniotic membrane processing, decellularizing that uh, membrane, and then later one using for the uh, transplant and A therapy, and A surgery. Here you see the uh, tissue, tissue engineering for the uh, grafts for skeletal uh, tissue recovering. Another important uh, center, it's the research and the uh, practical center of uh, medicinal plants. Uh, that it's, um, let's say, placed uh, on 60 hectares of square uh, uh, of the land, and they are, uh, are around 200 uh, taxa, taxons of medical plants. Uh, they are students from the uh, faculty of uh, pharmacy. They are learning how to uh, process all the technologies. Here you see actually the final product, which is in the market, but was done by uh, medical uh, medicine uh, research center, which is also a part of uh, the big center. About interinstitutional collaboration, it's. Uh, Professor Natalia Kalalp, she worked together with the Laboratory of Plants Biotechnology from the National Botanic Garden. And uh, actually, uh, what she is doing, she is doing something nicely uh, because she grow in vitro plants and also can add different substituents and then later to phenotype these plants and to show the differences on the, on the uh, active component. Another project is uh, Fagelland project, uh, which uh, started on the, uh, half a year ago. Uh, and Nikolai Testimitsano State University is one of the component from this big project, six countries are involved. But uh, actually we are essential, essential uh, component. Why? 
because we can make meta-analysis of the uh, let's say antibiotic consumption from whole country point by point also we can analyze the water everywhere in the country we have the biggest uh, let's say uh, natural based eco uh, friendly uh, vaster uh, uh, um, vast water uh, treatment in the uh, Orhei uh, city and what people is doing even they are collecting the uh, the water which is incoming to this waterland even sequenize the uh, amphibians and and then later to sequenize the amphibians from the uh, end of uh, process uh, of course in this project are used uh, the most contemporary machines from the uh, Belgium, from the UK, from the Poland, and, and, and Netherlands. So like this also we can uh, implement our, uh, let's say, contribution. Another project which just uh, uh, stopped uh, a few months ago, it's a project which is done together with ACGB and the pharma company, and the maybe next speaker uh, will tell you more about that. It's just to implement production of biosimilars here in the country. Thank you very much. Perfect. No questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess I guess during the lunch you can approach him and uh, say, "Tell me." So, thank you very much. Please uh, announce the next one. So, the next one will be uh, uh, George Baczynski, who is coming from the Balkan Pharma, and actually he will continue to talk uh, uh, with my last uh, slide. Good afternoon, dear moderators, dear professors, uh, dear guests and uh, colleagues. Uh, we are honored uh, for the opportunity to participate in these works of the symposium dedicated to the research in the field of biotechnological genetic engineering. As you can see on the screen, uh, our topic today is uh, Balkan Pharmaceuticals on the local and global market, recombinant DNA technology, biosimilars applications, and their share on global market and our future strategies. I'd like, you, I'd like to give you an overview of uh, our company, uh, which was founded in uh, 2006. Balkan Pharmaceuticals is the largest Romanian uh, private capital investment in Republic of Moldova, and the only manufacturer of uh, injectable forms in the country. The medicine uh, uh, factory in Sinjara is one of the largest in uh, South uh, Eastern Europe, and uh, it uh, has been approved by European GMP certification. Our first uh, brick was laid in 2006 uh, in Chisinau, setting our first manufacturing facility with a total area of 750 uh, square meters, which became a research unit in 2016 after opening our second uh, manufacturing facility in Sinjara with a production area of, of almost 12,000 square meters and engaging over 300 specialists. Uh, a new industrial complex uh, with an uh, area of uh, 700 meters, square meters uh, for the production of ProHealth line 
uh, will be launched in 2023 in uh, Rom Romania in Pashkan. Uh, at the moment, the company's portfolio consists of 250 products in different form and dosages, including antineoplastic agents, hormonal drugs, central ne uh, nervous system agents, cardiovascular and gastrointestinal medication, analgetics, and others, formulated in tablets, tablets, injectable suspensions and solutions, capsules and uh, powders. Every hour, uh, we produce 250,000 tablets and capsules, coated tablets and packets, 100,000 st uh, sterile solution, sterile powder in vials, and sterile lyophilized powder in uh, vials. Um, currently, Moldova manufactures over 400 generic drugs, 250 of which are produced by Balkan Pharmaceuticals. Uh, our company improves uh, medicine affordability on the local market, ensuring that the patient do not pay through higher price. We make 6% six, uh, 6 of the total local pharma market. According to the volume of sales in, in, uh, dollars, in US dollars, we are the top three, in the top three uh, pharmaceutical companies present on the Moldovan market. Uh, Balkan Pharmaceuticals is improving medicine affordability since 2008. The experience of these years, 2008-2012, showed that the appearance of the Balkan Pharmaceutical Company in the national, national drug approval auctions, and especially in the oncology segment, led to a decrease in the purchase price of some products used in the treatment of cancer by 80%. As a result, the number of patients who could benefit from the treatment increased, and today everyone can benefit from free treatment with this product. Balkan Pharmaceutical is growing the, outside the core, reaching new markets like Middle East, Romania, Portugal, and Greece, and most recently, the US market. Recently, the ProHealth line was launched on the European Union and the United States uh, of America markets. In the US, Balkan Pro Health was launched in October uh, at the Mr. Olympia competition 2021 in Orlando, Florida, and the products are expected in the US market in the second half of uh, 2022. Uh, our company is building a winning reputation by standing for quality and service. We have made a commitment to manufacture uh, drugs that are uh, of the highest quality, yet affordable for all members uh, of our uh, society. We have pioneered new ways of bringing modern medicine to our pa patients. And we strive to finish the unfinished and to become the most trusted, innovative and reliable pharmaceutical company in the Eastern Europe. Obtaining a more reliable and less expensive source for a drug would be reason enough to pursue the line of research and development of biosimilars as a cost-cutting strategy in the delivery of the state-of-the-art healthcare in developing countries at a fraction of what a reference biological would cost. The trajectory of biosimilars has changed and according to the current projections will continue on an upward path. With continued increases in biological spending expected, the biosimilar market presents an opportunity for savings on medicines. Some key breakthroughs started in 2019 when Moldova uh, became a member uh, in March 2019 when Moldova became a member country of the ICGB and only four months later in July uh, the technology transfer cultivation process of Pikia pastoris with the expression of growth hormone takes place at ICGB headquarters in uh, Trieste with a team of three specialists from Balkan Pharmaceuticals. In 2020, uh, Balkan Pharmaceuticals equipped a new laboratory for the technology transfer from ICGEB. Uh, cultivation process of Pikia pastoris with the expression of growth hormone has started in January 2021 within the uh, Nikolaitis Timitsano State University. 
In 2022, Balkan Pharmaceuticals and uh, Nikolai Testimitsano State University managed to create the working cell bank of Pikia Pastoris culture for short and long term storage with subsequent inoculum preparation and growth of Pikia Pastoris culture with uh, recombinant human growth hormone expression. Bio, uh, biotechnological methods enable the development of novel treatments for many highly serious diseases, clinically and epi epidemiologically, and makes it possible to create solution for the growing healthcare needs of the population. Biosimilars are produced from organisms and life systems through biotechnological processes, such as recombinant DNA technology. The, produ uh, the production of biotechnology, uh, biotechnological medicines began in 1982 with insulin and continued with growth hormones, erythropoietin, various interferons, enzymes, coagulation factors, vaccine anticlonal, uh, monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies, and numerous different medications, which carry great importance of healthcare, uh, healthcare expenditures. First biosimilar uh, human growth hormone was Omnitrope, approved by EMA in 2006, has since been approved worldwide, including in the US, and the product is now available in more than 50 countries. With an average wholesale, wholesale price and wholesale acquisition price at 40% uh, less than traditional human growth uh, hormone products. Now, uh, it's, uh, let's go through our amazing experience at ICGB headquarters in uh, Trieste, Italy. For one month uh, at ICGB, our three specialists learned the entire process of producing human growth hormone through a recomb uh, recombinant DNA technology in order to bring the know-how in Moldova. I will take you briefly through the entire process. Uh, first, uh, step was human growth hormone first gene cloning, which was done in three steps. Pikia transformation, selection of Pikia pastoris together with human growth hormone, long and short term storage. Uh, the second step was expression of human growth hormone, uh, hormone and uh, specifically the culture growth itself, followed by fermentation brought uh, clarification. Uh, the, first, the third step was uh, the purification of the protein and was performed with the cation exchange chromatography and hydrophobic interaction chromatography. And the last step was quality control. Okay, um, the HGH, we'll say it shortly, uh, gene is cut out of the restriction enzymes uh, directionally closed into Pikia pastoris host plasmid. Newly engineered, do we have the pointer here? Yeah. The red one? Yeah, it's this one. Okay. Okay. The newly formed, uh, uh, the newly engineered plasmid is linearized with restriction enzyme inserted into Pikia genome by electroporation. Clones gr growing on agar plate with different geneti geneticine concentrations were selected and tested for their capacity to, sec uh, to uh, secrete human growth hormone. Uh, the culture growth. Pikia, uh, with the, uh, Pikia pastoris with human uh, growth hormone strains were harvested and suspended in, IPD, in YPD medium and, pla and placed in the fermenter where they will be fed for five days. Micro microorganisms that carry the human growth hormone gene are induced under specifically controlled conditions of nutrition, aeration and mixing to grow and reproduce at a much higher rate than their natural rate and therefore giving rise to the large-scale production of the protein. The fermentation broth is then centrifuged and the supernatant with secreted uh, HGH is separated from the cell pellet. Uh, the purification process I already mentioned, it's, we used cation exchange chromatography and hydrophobic uh, interaction chromatography. All clean fractions obtained are at least 94% of pure uh, human growth hormone. The final step was the quality control analysis. Analysis were performed according to the European pharmacopoeia monographs 
and the HGH batch from ICGB passed all the analysis performed. Now, the working cell bank. Uh, the long, uh, first thing that we did when we came back from ICGB was creating the working cell bank, a vial collection of uh, serially subcultivated cells that are derived from the master cell bank. The working cell bank is used to establish seed cultures of the cell line to initiate the manufacturing process. Uh, the yeast use, uh, used in the process is well known for its, uh, its advantages. It grows quickly, it has high yields, low cost of media, and low fermentator costs. As a result, in five days, that is the time spent on a single batch, from 11 liters of supernatant, we were able to uh, obtain two grams of pure hu uh, human growth hormone. This is important because The, the biosimilars have the potential to reduce overall medicine expenditures, but most importantly to increase access to biological uh, th therapies, thereby improving patients' outcomes. Uh, now, uh, from the first biosimilar approval in 2006 to 2010, companies in the European Union used to represent 67% of the manufacturer gaining U EU approvals for the new biosimilars on the market while U.S. and Indian companies each accounted for 11% of these approvals. But now many other countries, uh, hoping soon, uh, including Moldova, are involved in biosimilar uh, development and uh, commercialization. Uh, on the U.S. market, there are currently 38 biosimilars approved by the FDA. The most recent biosimilar ap approval was on 1st of September, and it was Stimufend, the Big field grass team. Sale of biosimilars over the next five years could total 80 billion, depending on the volume uptake and pricing discounts. Since the passage to, uh, of the Biosimilars Act, 17 billion of uh, biosimilar spendings have been associ associated with savings of 37 billion. The next five years are expected to result in an almost five-fold increase in savings. Uh, in this diagram, you'll see that the three most recent biosimilar launches, Bevacizumab, Trastuzumab, and uh, Rituximab, are set to reach nearly 60% shares of the volume by the end of their second year of the market, which is significant, uh, significantly higher and faster than prior biosimilars. Absolute saving from, uh, savings from biosimilars vary, with the larger savings from more recent launches, as I mentioned earlier, where originators were most costly. Patients are benefiting from average sales price reductions of over 500 to 1900 uh, US dollars for a standard course of treatment uh, on uh, the three most recent biosimilars launched. Medicare and commercial patients save an average of $17 per prescription while, while using like uh, biosimilar insulin. Um, whereas in Europe, most biosimilar are marketing with a discount of 20 to 35% versus the price of uh, reference products. Since 2006, Europe has approved 86 biosimilars, the largest number of biosimilars potential savings rise up to $100 billion and are expected to be reached by 2023. This allows patients to receive therapies that were difficult or even impossible to be received. For example, in countries where access to erythropoietins was especially restricted, like Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Romania, cost savings have been estimated at 50% with an increase in average of uh, more than 250% for a biosimilar. So we'll skip the Indian market and we'll go back to our local market. This is important to everything I spoke and was very important to emphasize because in Moldova there is no precedent of biosimilars production. Uh, in Europe, uh, most uh, biosimilars, okay, not this one. With the development of biosimilars medicine, 
Medicines, Balkan Pharmaceuticals, aims to meet the high need for biological medicines in our country at a lower cost, ensuring competition and incentivize uh, research and development. This was the word I, I was preparing two hours for. Okay. Uh, our main goals are uh, to uh, invest in R&D department, train highly qualified specialists, improve national security, and the affordability of biologics. Uh, Balkan Pharmaceuticals is nurturing to a collective sense of purpose with R&D employees finding fulfillment from being part of a cutting-edge scientific endeavor that will benefit large numbers of people. We hope this is the last, last slide. Almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Uh, Balkan Pharmaceuticals would, cre would create a huge range of medical pharmaceutical disciplines in collaboration with governments, universities and clinicians and provide good job opportunities. This is the job growth outlook, the demand for biosimilars related jobs all over the world. So we see the, the uh, increase. Uh, go for the most important. By facilitating continuous domestic manufacturing of essential drugs, we can improve national security and increase drug accessibility uh, in emergencies such as natural disasters, pandemic and worse. The COVID pandemic showed us that domestic manufacturing can improve the accessibility of drugs. The ability to produce quality drugs on demand, as it was during the pandemic, can circumvent delays. Uh, okay, uh, our, uh, we uh, think that the local manufacturing of the human growth, the recombinant human growth hormone, obviously offers an incomparable pharmacoeconomic advantage both over the existing competitor on the market and over the potential ones. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry that I <laughs> interrupted you, but, uh, you know, we have more three speakers. Yes. <laughs> and everybody wants to eat. Do you have some questions? Uh, okay, the, um, our uh, facility from Singer, what which I spoken about, has been approved by uh, has a e EU uh, G GMP approval uh, since this year. So uh, now we are uh, uh, preparing the laboratory for the technology transfer, and then we are now building the uh, the space needed for the scale up uh, segment. So actually. Uh, the two lines for the production of uh, sterile uh, solutions uh, and uh, the, the tablets and the solid forms are already GMP approved uh, with the European Union. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure about the, but I think we'll need to approve the, um, the line for uh, uh, the human growth hormone, like the scale up line. And we hope we'll, we'll succeed. I know we will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, tech Misha, uh, so we are in, in the crossroads uh, to listen for online uh, presenters and yeah, or to listen to Janos Koretsky. Uh, are you here? So then, okay. Thank you very much for your understanding.
Yes, okay. So, distinguished guests, uh, dear colleagues, in today's pr presentation, I'll try to highlight the result of a successful collaboration between our university, namely, mainly the Department of Pharmacology and Clinical Pharmacology, and the Biotechnos, that is Strategic Institutional Development Board member. Uh, so, uh, since the ancient time, uh, insects and substances derived from their biomass have been widely used as uh, agents, as medicine for treatment of different diseases. Uh, sometimes you were given even uh, mystical properties. As medicine, insects and their derivatives have several advantages. Uh, first of all, they are safe enough. They have low toxicity. They are of low toxicity. Then, uh, resistance of some microorganisms to their antimicrobial effect usually doesn't develop. Uh, the use of insects and of products obtained from them in the for the therapeutic uh, purposes is known as entomotherapy. No, additionally, uh, insects represent about a million species uh, generally in the world that makes about 70% from the total number of, of species of uh, contemporary organisms on the earth. Uh, the enormous diversity, but also the direct connection with the human species cause their wide use as a food and additionally as a source of obtaining some uh, medicines. Uh, the beauty of some species of insects amazes. Uh, that's why uh, some people, some companies uh, wanted to enjoy uh, this beauty. And this led to development of a relatively new field, uh, namely of the breeding of ornamental insects. But my presentation is not about these ornamental insects. Additionally, uh, insects are used as a food in a lot of countries. I think you know, um, more than 50 percent of think of countries use different species of insects as food. Uh, they are highly the highest rate of uh, use of insects as food is seen in the uh, China, as I know, and in uh, India, as I know. I went to the beginning. No. Additionally, another branch of uh, insect use is uh, beekeeping or apiculture and sericulture. Uh, insects are of very high use in the biological control of pests. They have a special role in the biological control of pests for the impact of natural parasites of disease-causing insects on agricultural plants and domestic animals. Among the species used at this level are trichograms, uh, ladybugs, bedbugs, for which mask cultivation technologies are already being developed. Uh, the direction of using insects for biological control of pests uh, perfectly fits into the current uh, trend of limiting the use of uh, pesticides and insecticides. As uh, you can see, insects are a good enough therapeutic option for treatment of different diseases. As for example, seal form, uh, namely the image of pupae, uh, have been used in traditional Chinese medicine for more than three millennia to treat apoplexy, bronchitis, pneumonia, convulsions, hemorrhage, and frequent urination. Additionally, silk is used as a basis for the thermostabilization of vaccines and for impregnation with some antibacterial agents. Uh, this is the Mircea uh, Chukri, the founder of the study of entomoviruses from the perspective of the relationship to the immune system. And uh, this research has served as a basis of discovery of the respective scientists. Uh, this discovery refers to the methods of combating harmful uh, harmful insects, but also to a fundamentally new direction in the field of the pharmaceutical industry, the production of the preparation based on the extracts obtained from the insects. 
Uh, in 1992, uh, Professor Chukri initiated research which resulted in obtaining preparation with complex action on the body, namely anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, immunomodulatory and keratolytic. Uh, some of these researches were done in our university, mainly in the uh, department again of pharmacology and clinical pharmacology. Uh, results of researches later were patented and uh, Later, uh, the Biotechnos company was developed based on previous researches. Uh, Biotechnos is an innovative company whose activities are the development and production of original medicines, pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical active substances. We are based on the research infrastructure intensively developed over the last 10 years in the field of pharmaceuticals and related fields, biotechnology, cellular, cellular and molecular biology, dermatocosmetics oriented at the same time to certain strategic requirements of the food industry regarding consumer safety. And now let me present you a short spot about the uh, biotechnology itself. It's about 40 seconds, not longer. So, as you saw, the production of the uh, pharmaceutical substances is carried out under control conditions with the use of the most uh, contemporary equipment and devices. And uh, Biotechnos, of course, has a, a quality assurance unit. Uh, of course, it was awarded with the uh, respective GLP and uh, good dispensing certificates. Can you start the presentation, please? Among the portfolio of biotechnos, we can find adenoprosine. Uh, adenoprosine are, uh, is delivered as rectal suppositories of 150 milligram. The active ingredient of adenoprosine uh, is obtained from the, uh, from the insect species Limantria dispar following the use of advanced biotechnologies. Uh, itself it represents a biopeptide. Uh, adenoprosine is used mainly for the treatment of benign prostate hyperplasia, for the treatment of chronic prostatitis, for the treatment of uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and additionally for conditions after surgical interventions of the prostate. The active Complex adenoprosin obtained from the insect species Limantria dispar uh, has some specific biological and pharmacological action. Mainly it has antioxidant activity, manifested itself by inhibition of the uh, oxidation of low density lipoproteins and by decreasing the generation of uh, nitrogen free radicals. Uh, adenoprosin doesn't exhibit toxicity towards the normal cell it contacts, which justifies use in the form of. Uh, rectal suppositories. Uh, about the research of 
uh, adenoprosin, about nine uh, clinical uh, studies were done, uh, five of which were done in Moldova, and four abroad. Uh, two studies were done as uh, pre-marketing studies, and seven were post-marketing studies. Uh, you cannot see something. Thank you very much. Spondylis, just, just a moment. Spondylis active complex is a standardized etymological bioactive extract from Limantria dispar species. It regulates the elimination or generation of free radicals. Additionally, it normalizes the macro, uh, sorry, microcirculation at the site where it's applied. It's associated with the extract from sage, chestnut, and rosemary. And additionally, for, uh, with methyl salicylate, uh, these substances have their own effects. Imuhiptin is another one agent. Uh, it is an entomological extract obtained from the larvae of uh, the tenebrial larvae, which has an immunomodulatory, anti-proliferatory, anti-proliferative, sorry, hepatoprotective and antioxidant properties. The product amplifies the toxification process and increases the metabolizing activity of the liver. Uh, Imupurin has mainly immunomodulatory, anti-proliferatory, and antioxidant effects. The active substance is an entomological extract obtained from the pupae of the Bombyx mori. It's an immunomodulatory product. It stimulates the immunological reactivity and general resistance of the body. Additionally, it intensifies the or speed up the regeneration processes, the ability to form interferon. We found that it has some inter interferonogenic action. Uh, that can be excluded. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's some extra urgent question? No. no. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. according to our plan, Senate Lata Singla. Perek, group leader from the uh, New Delhi, would tell us about uh, plant <laughs> stress biology. Okay, are you with us? Suddenly disappeared. Please, uh, you are with us, floor is yours. So, a very good, very good morning to one and all. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share some of the interesting findings that we have carried out at ICT in your daily and the topic for today's talk is kept as Aspirations from Agriculture Biotechnology, Success Stories for Developing Multiple Stress Tolerance Plan. So basically I'm going to discuss with you the help of biotechnology, uh, how biotechnology has helped us to uh, meet the goals for raising multiple stress tolerance plans. So with that, I would like to start the presentation by this world's biggest health problem that globally more than 1 million people suffer from hunger. This means that 1 in every 6 people on earth do not get enough food to live a healthy life. But it's moving towards food insecure because of three major reasons that we are going to be 10 billion very soon by the year 2050. And apart from that, there, there is a lot of organization and farmers are re uh, reducing in number because the farming profession is no more lucrative, so very few farmers are not interested in doing the farming. And apart from that, uh, the environmental stresses pose a big, big threat to the productivity. Uh, the environmental stresses, if we talk about the drought, where we have very little water, and salinity, where the water is benign, are the two major threats to agriculture worldwide. As you can see on the right side, the 25% of the land agriculture. So this slide, uh, I have tried to summarize the global efforts that are going on to enhance stress tolerance in rice, be, uh, through, through engineering 
of different pathways like ion homeostasis, transcription factors, signal transition, antioxidants, os osmotic homeostasis. And we have seen that all these manipulations have led to improved performance and the salinity and drought stress response. However, we have to realize that there is, uh, there is no uh, major impact that has uh, you know, still happened. So incremental improvement has been done. We performed uh, the gene stacking for addressing food security. And we were trying to jiggle with different targets like a jigsaw puzzle, what would fit back, uh, best with each one. And then to the, uh, for today's presentation, I have selected golden triplets, where we have got tremendous success in improving stress in as well as uh, stress tolerance as well as the top E. So here we will be talking about two different pathways of tolerance. One deals with the cellular detoxification and other deals with the iron partition. So cellular detoxification, I will talk about the glyoxidase pathway and for iron partitioning, I will be dealing with sodium product and odors. So coming up, to the cellular detoxification by a glyoxidase pathway. So the glyoxidase pathway basically consists of two enzymes, glyoxidase 1 and 2, whose major role is to convert this toxic molecule methyl glyoxal into non-toxic molecule D-lactic. So what is this methyl This is a metabolite that is produced as a byproduct of glycolysis. That means this happens in all living organisms from bacteria to man. You have it, I have it, and even the bacteria have it. But why, why we need to worry about the methylglycol? Because it's a very reactive compound, and it tends to form adults with DNA, RNA, and proteins, and that, that is very nasty to the system that interferes with the metabolism. So uh, it has been reported a couple of years back that under disease condition, be it fever, cancer, in case of human beings, so the methyl glycol levels used to show up. And uh, it, it is brought down with the help of these glycerin enzyme, glycerin And uh, so we thought of, because we discovered that this pathway is present in plants, so we thought that whether methyl glycol is really a problem or it accumulates when the plant is under stress condition. Like human beings are under stress, this accumulates. Is that true for plant system as well? So we tried testing this, uh, uh, you know, uh, detection of methyl glycol under stress condition. So this panel basically shows you the control situation when the plants were not stressed. And here on the right side, this this is when we are under 200 days for the NSCA. So as you can see, the visible uh, differences in the chlorophyll retention. As you can see, these are these places where we reach out, and we found that a lot of methyl glycol got accumulated in the presence of salinity stress. So uh, later on we proved that not only salinity stress but other abiotic stresses or biotic stresses as well do that in, uh, lead to the accumulation of lots of methyl glycol, be it trout, meat, coal, and etc. So we thought of combining glycol 1 and 2 in, in using the transgenic system we tried to address whether uh, engineering of this enzyme really help plants to tolerate abiotic stress. So we use the model system tobacco and as you can see on the right side, uh, we, this is the white type, means non transgenic plant. This is a single gene, glycosylis 1, glycosylis 2, and the both genes put together. That means the entire pathway was engineered here, overexpressed here. As you can clearly see, the, when the entire pathway was overexpressed, and when these plants were challenged with salinity, you can clearly see a marked difference between the survival capacity as compared to the wild type or the single gene transform. The two genes together were working very well to tolerate salinity stress. So not only salinity stress, we extended our study to heavy metal stress and we can as, uh, see in the lower panel, like here, when we have both the genes together, these are better able to survive the heavy metal stress as well. So having seen this proof of concept in tobacco, we thought of transferring this technology to rice for translation research. So uh, uh, we, we, uh, for transforming rice, we again uh, put both the key glycolase 
one and two together on a single construct and we develop transgenic rice, molecular ether on them, and then we challenge these transgenic rice to different environmental stresses. Remember I told you that the high blood cell is increasing in amount in response to salinity, drought, heat, as well as biotic stresses. So we challenge these plants to salinity stress. As you can see, wild type versus the transgenic line, you can clearly see they are very well surviving. Potassium to sodium ratio was very well maintained. And also, this is the root picture saying the corona dye, it's not the virus corona, but it is a, it is a dry fluorescent dye which can detect sodium ions and more the fluorescent, more the sodium ions. So as you can see, wild type roots accumulate blood sodium, but the transgenic groups show very little flaws. That means that they were not really accumulating sodium in them. So we extended this study and uh, exposed these plants to drought stress where we did not water them for 25 days and you can see the typical symptoms of drought stress where the leaves would roll and when we rewatered them the, the leaf blades really opened up but the wild type could not recover even after 30 days of rewatering. However, the transgenic plants which were over its missing black spirit path, they really were able to survive and they have a very deeper root system showing the, uh, the metabolic health or the physiological health of the plant. Similar results were obtained for heat stress tolerance as well as the biotic stress tolerance. The nutrient length was very small in case of transgenic, this will be the wild type and also when we checked the expression of various PR genes, they were really high in case of uh, you know uh, the transgenic lines, the the glandular transgenic lines as compared to the biotic lines. And we then checked what is the methylacyl level in them, and we found that uh, when we have in like, the methylacyl levels under salinity stress, drought, heat, and biotic stress was increasing tremendously in case of wild type. But in case of transgenic lines, this was really restricted. So that, that may be the major reason why these plants are able to tackle all these stresses in a better way. So uh, having seen this, uh, we, we went ahead and uh, you know uh, we tried to engineer another approach which is for the ion partition via sodium proton antipodal, which are sodium hydrogen exchanger as well as SOS1. So these are the two uh, sodium pumps existing in plants. One is NHX which is vacuum localized and it throws sodium inside the vacuum in exchange of one proton. And the another pump is localized on the plasma membrane which throws sodium out of the cell. So having these two pumps in plant system, we engineer each of them and try to address whether uh, they are able to help the plant to tolerate salinity stress in a better way. So uh, this, this NHX gene was cloned and transgenic plants were generated and this is a typical nucleus essay where you expose wild type and transgenic plants to sodium chloride increasing concentration and you see bleaching happening in the transgenic, uh, in the wild type plant lines for the time by the transgenic were able to retain their growth rate. Similarly, the seed germination was enhanced in case of transgenic line, this will be the wild type. So that gave us enough confidence that NHS is really helping the system to tolerate uh, sodium chloride stress. So, so uh, we thought of now combining both the pathways together, the cellular detoxification plus ion homeostasis, and then we combine dragon with NHS and dragon with SOS1. Again, using the modern system tobacco, we had the proof of concept that these uh, triple construct containing the diamond dry furniture and the diamond dry sauce one were able to survive better than the double of the single construct. So, we, using these triple constructs, we uh, went ahead and made the triple transgenic line. To do that, I would like to proudly share that we have developed a very efficient, rapid, and universal method for rice transformation that can handle any of the rice genotypes for genetic transgenic plant that is true for genetic transformation or gene editing. And we have got a patent on that. 
And we have also developed an antibiotic marker free selector system, which is very, very, very important as far as the genetic transformation of the DNA is concerned. So having these things in hand, we generated transgene line using these triple constructs. And uh, to, for the benefit of the young investigators, we have to see that the transgenes are sitting inside the host plant. And uh, this is basically confirmation by PCR. This is confirmation by southern knotting and by western knotting that the genes are sitting in, the proteins are being made. And having seen this, we challenge the single double and triple transgene line with the wide type with uh, salinity stress to see what is the advantage that these plants got for the germination capacity. Because as we know that rice is very, very sensitive at the seed germination state and also at the reproductive state. So seed germination testing clearly show us that as compared to the wild type, there is an incremental uh, you know, advantage when you keep on crushing in more chain. The triple ones definitely with the glycogen and the glycogen sauce, they are definitely better able to survive and sustain their growth in the presence of salinity stress. So similarly, we check further for the seed in growth in the presence of uh, ECO14, like the pot and uh, under salinity stress. And again, uh, we find that the wild type was not able to sustain its growth while the triple transgenic, whether it is with DNHX or with the sauce line, both of them were better able to survive under this condition. So this is the ultimate test that we did for the stress tolerance at the reproduction stage. And this is with the, for the vacuum sequestration, where we combine with the DNHX, and for PM exclusion, where we have the SOS1 with the apply to, and this is on the left side is the Y type and the single gene transformant and the two gene transformant. As you can clearly see, when they were challenged with the salinity stress of 10 EC, we can see that Y type is not able to sustain its growth and produce any seeds, while the triple transgenics were the best ones, which were able to not only survive, grow, but also produce grains. So, that indicates that these are able to tackle the salinity stress in a very, very nice way. So having seen their survival, it's very important to look at the physiological and agronomic traits uh, for these plants. And as we can see that we scored various parameters like plant height, number of panicles, spin prints per panicle, total grain yield, thousand grain weight, Greater photosynthesis, FD over FM ratio, and the accumulation and related water content everywhere. Uh, if you compare the pink line, which is white type under salinity, versus the both the blue lines, which are TCNHX, the triple constructed NHX, or triple constructed SOS1 gene, like here the blue and the light green bar, they are better, they have the better parameter as compared to the pink bar. Pink is the white type under stress. And you can see the anti accumulation was tremendous in this case, and that under other uh, you know beneficial traits like the filtering etc. were really coming towards zero. So this indicated us that engineering or stacking of three genes together is really helping the system to survive under stress condition and also give us good aim. So having seen this, we wanted to test whether uh, this trait that we have introduced is functionally and genetically stable in the next generation. And in this picture, you can see that in the middle is the Y type. On the right hand side is the NHX, Plyon plus Plyo, and the Plyon plus Plyo plus NHX. And on the left side are the SOS1 double construct and the triple construct. As you can clearly see, the trip, both the kind of triple constructs were really were able to grow much, much better than the wild type when they were exposed to soil stress for 15 days. Thereby indicating that this is a really genetically and functionally stable trait. This is a picture taken at the for generation. And having seen this, we challenge this plant with uh, an addition. 
initial stress, which is a child stress, a relative stress, I would say, where we did not water them for 20 days. And this lower panel shows you the white egg on the left side, which when we show the uh, very strong symptoms of adult stress. And uh, here on the right most side is the triple cluster picture, where we can see that this was able to not only survive, but also uh, was able to be, you know, great. And this red diagram shows you. Again, the pink bar shows for the wild day, but the same is on the drought, and she shows that various parameters were really compromised here, while in the trans uh, these were better able to sustain. So, again, showing that under drought stress, these are able to survive as well as E, and we have the triple cost of transforming them. Most important parameter is that if we have to use this technology for agriculture sustainability, we should be looking at what is the ultimate yield, you know, uh, penalty of that. So this now basically uh, summarizes the person in penalty under salinity, drought, heat, and arsenic stress. And as you can see, the green bar is for the one type, where you can see always there is, uh, you know, somewhere sixty-five percent. 90%, 80%, or again 60% in that gene, but when you go on flushing the individual gene over SOS energetic or SOS1, then glycogen value, glycogen value plus energetic and glycogen value plus SOS1, as you can keep on varying the genes, the penalty is really reducing, better, and the case is similar, the results are similar even for salinity or drought, or heat stress, as well as the chemical stress. So every day we observe that if we have these two pathways combined together, then we are able to have a reduce the penalty and we really reduce the key gap that happens because of multiple stresses in the form of speed. So these, some of these products are now in the translating mode. They have moved from that to industry, and one of the seed companies is currently field testing them and I go into what commercialization and we hope that really in the near future these products will be out in the market. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, it's really interesting uh, report on stress in the plants. But as a, a normal surgeon, sometimes cannot think about that. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. So next, next one will be Katya Van uh, Bushadze. It's a cluster yes. development agreement. Uh, UNDP is 
is responsible for development and functioning of the clustering approach in the packaging sector, uh, supports strategic investments and improve clusters. And IMM is responsible for mainstreaming migration in SME development. Uh, under the joint unit, under the UN joint program, UNIVERS activities were implemented, and they are the following. Uh, 50 uh, seven emerging and potential manufacturing clusters and other businesses were met. Uh, trainings uh, were conducted on cluster development, uh, and people, including 43% of women, were trained. And nine diagnostic studies were conducted. Up to two pilot clusters, which is pharmaceutical efficiency and marine fishing in Venezuela and San Pedro, were supported to develop collective actions, establishing first activities and strengthening in-between corporations. The awareness raising of cluster development still is ongoing process. Uh, a number of activities uh, for the pharmaceutical sector were implemented by UNICO. Some of them are successfully implemented and finished, some of them are ongoing, and some of them are planned to be implemented. Uh, they are following support cluster members in the process of complying with the standards such as GMP, good manufacturing practice, arrange cycle of trainings and coaching sessions for GMP, e-commerce, and e-marketing, um, identify and support linkages to similar uh, international pharmaceutical clusters and associations, support cluster members and enterprises in accessing export markets, and establishment the International Conference in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia. Uh, briefly about the uh, Georgian pharmaceutical sector as a general, uh, it is a quite complex and combines several supporting institutions and businesses, each producing different types and categories of products, including uh, manufacturing of bacterial pages, herbal pharmaceuticals, generics, antibiotics, and relatively simple pharmaceutical products. From the three uh, conditional subsectors, the focus of the Georgian pharmaceutical cluster is manufacturing of pages and herbal pharmaceutical products. Uh, Georgia Pharmaceutical Cluster was officially established in Georgia recently and the main uh, aim of the cluster is to become one of the major pharmaceutical clusters in the world and establish leadership position in the production of bacterial pages and herbal pharmaceuticals by leading on the extensive know-how and experience of Georgian research and development and private sector capacity and deliver benefits to the world for innovative and organic products. Currently, Georgian pharmaceutical cluster uh, unites uh, up to eight pharmaceutical producers, and uh, a number of supporting organizations are on the way to join. Uh, in Tbilisi, we have three uh, main pharmaceutical uh, bacterial page producers, and they are in level value propositions, Biofilm and Biofilm M. Uh, all of them were established for more than 20 years, um, and it had to be noted that more than 50% of the employee of these companies are women. The products that uh, Pages producers produce are uh, pages for human health, uh, and animal health and customized pages for individual patients. Uh, shortly about the prehistory of pages, uh, since 1930, Georgia is a pioneer and leader in research and development and the production of bacteria pages. Uh, after the World, Second World War, thousands of remedies were distributed from Georgia to all over the USSR uh, from the Caribbean Institute. Uh, and they were used in tandem with the antibiotics. And the pages are currently considered as a new and emerging sector and they are gaining the increased interest because they are used for fitting various bacterial infections and what is the most what is also very important with the increase of drug resistance thanks bacteria potential role of pages is an interest of many countries. Now what is bacterial phage? Bacterial phage, as well as known as phage, is a group of viruses that infects only bacteria, including pathogenic microorganisms. Phage is one of the most abundant microorganisms 
on Earth are very specific and they destroy trillions of bacteria every day. Uh, Fridge is natural energy of bacteria and they are completely safe for humans. How do they work? Bacteriophage is looking for the host bacteria and infect it by injecting its biological uh, uh, material into bacteria. Phages use bacteria as a factory of reproduction. And after this reproduction phase, phages burst the bacteria and thousands of new phages escape. Uh, phage therapy means the treatment of bacterial infections using bacteriophage preparations. Phages eliminate specific bacteria after administration, they start to multiply and using bacterial cells as food and they leave the body once the pathogens are eliminated. Phages are extremely effective. Um, uh, they are able to destroy bacteria, they selectively target certain bacteria and are unable to harm, harm humans, animals or plants. And specially selected phages eliminate only disease causing bacteria without harming beneficial microflora. Phage therapy has no side effects. Uh, so the bacteria phage were discovered in the early 90s, and in 1990 uh, they were first used for the human uh, therapy by French scientist, microbiologist Felix Terrell, who met Georgian scientists. In Paris, and two years later, uh, they founded the Bacteriophage Research Institute in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia. Uh, so, the history of phage in Georgia begins from 1923, and during the following 60 years, the Yakov Institute became a worldwide center for research, development, and production of bacteriophage preparation. In uh, 2008, on the basis of the Yakov Institute, Eliado Consorcio was created. Now I want to ask my colleague, Sofa, to continue and speak about the page research and application. Sofa, the floor is yours. We can't see, uh, hear you. So, can you enable the screen share for me, please? Better. Please, now, can you try to share your screen? Yeah. Do you have from the... All right, all right, we, we see your screen. Okay, so I will talk about the research and development of the Yellow Institute, and I will continue from the Yellow Consortium, which was funded uh, on the basis of the Yellow Institute in 2008. And the Yellow Consortium unites um, different uh, departments which create the continuous chain. It means that we have a diagnostic center, so for patient, after diagnosis, they have the phase therapy center and then the bacterial phase reduction for the patients. So the main direction of the Yava Institute is the bacteriology and biology. So we have the, one of the biggest collection of the material strengths and page collection in the world, and uh, also the collection of bacterial strains, including antibiotic resistance strains, those that are responsible for several bacterial infections, um, starting from Staphylococci to the uh, Moraxella or Pepsiella. And um, you know, we are um, preparing and isolating new pages um, every uh, day. It's our uh, every day you need to regulate and to study new bacterial pages against the water resistant bacterial strains. For the main um, our uh, main field to use uh, bacterial pages is for the human health, but also pages are used in the veterinary and agriculture and um, plant um, infection to infection, also infection of uh, 
uh, surfaces, for example, to avoid hospital required infections and for disinfection of surfaces. It's maybe uh, not for hospitals, also um, dairy products, uh, with companies, and um, other. Um, also, what is important about the page um, application, um, pages are, um, we are producing liquid pages, mainly for oral youth, and um, we are researching to produce five different pages. The five are the um, cocktail of pages, and only one which is single page or several of pages. All other five products of the other pages are mix of the different but the your pages again the influent infection against intestinal infection. Also, we have a personalized page products, for example, it's our creams and suppositories, um, you know, suppositories of bacterial pages. Uh, about the uh, use of the bacterial pages for human health, we have several projects. Um, small clinical trials um, to um, um, for, um, um, to show effectiveness and um, importance of bacterial pages compared to antibiotic and also to um, see their effectiveness on uh, antibiotic and bacterial, bacterial strength. So here I'm Presenting two uh, last uh, research uh, topics, which was founded by the Institute. Uh, one was funded by Swiss National Science Foundation, and it was the small clinical trial on um, patients' participations. And uh, uh, it was the randomized placebo control uh, um, clinical trial, where we had three main groups. One was treated with uh, PLA, which is the product of the Riala Consortium, so a Riala Bio preparation using this uh, preparation. And the uh, second row was treated with placebo, and the third row was treated with antibiotics. So this uh, clinical trial was conducted with Ulysses, who is a urology center, and we had 40 and 74 patients, um, so during two years, from 2017 to 2019, and uh, 130 patients were randomly assigned to treatment. And so the isolated bacterial corpus were Cherifia colani, Enterococcus fecalis, Proteus diabetes, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the phase susceptibility on the clinical trial was 80%. It was not better than antibiotic therapy but it was not worse than antibiotic therapy So 65 patients was totally treated with bacterial pages and the um, complication was not better. But as Kata mentioned, uh, the most important um, advantage of bacterial pages is that they don't have side effects and this is really true. So they cause no harm in the home microflora, they cause no allergy and they cause no harm to human cells. So uh, by this um, research, it was also highlighted that the uh, antibiotics uh, cause no complications. Of course, uh, there was a lot of clinical trials in the era of COVID-19, but this um, clinical trials was in Russia and in European languages, and we have a lot of information which is still under translation for assessment and the publication. A lot of uh, um, uh, cases, uh, the effective use of antibiotic uh, bacterial pages in uh, uh, children, especially bacterial diarrhea. So the next project, which was funded by European Union under the World Laboratory in 2020, uh, was the construction that produces resting and phase therapy for asthma patients. So we know that the asthma uh, not the disease which can be cured by bacterial phages, but the use of bacterial phages can improve and recover uh, the microbiota and the obiosis of patients. So the main idea of the project was to 
are clearly the bank of the battery of the GCP, the battery of the to be isolated from the infection. The study was done in Greece, so they were sending uh, battery of strength to the other institute and then we are related back to the pages. So the strength for starting from Asinetro back to the Demora, Sela, Sadro, Aureus, and we reached our collection, sorry, different pages, which is well characterized and the genetically, um, biologically genetically characterized. And then in this uh, project, page of networking analysis was done by Manchester University. That was a um, mathematical modeling program. Uh, next, our one of the uh, important, innovative, and uh, successful program is the personalized page setup, which we are referring to our patient. So here you can see the list of the countries. So we have a lot of patients you know, all around the world, so starting from Australia to Canada. Okay, and here are the list of the number of pages, personalized pages, which was produced during 2018 to 2022. These are the number of here uh, personalized pages. So the personalized pages are offered to the patients um, who have uh, bacterial strains not susceptible to our commercially available. So first, the patient the Leava Consortium, the Leava Page Therapy Center, they do susceptibility tests um, based on our commercial uh, available page preparation. And if they uh, are not successful, they are not working, then patients are offered to get personalized uh, pages. So, and personalized pages are especially for the patients, and uh, they can treatment at the Aliaba Center or we can send the page uh, uh, to them. So we, we are offering two uh, methods of treatment, which is the local and the redistance, just to send the bacterial pages. And the success rate of personalized page uh, therapy is 95%. Um, so about the human health, also I add that uh, right now we've got the patent on production of uh, uh, pastils, stage pastils, which is the combination of herbal plant um, composite and bacterial phages. So the pastils are um, uh, the pastils, uh, there is a lot of different pastils in the Georgian Market, uh, but uh, our product uh, will be just natural combination of plants, eucalyptus, and bacterial phage. And uh, we got patent this year, and also we did very um, small, but it was pilot program. And right now we submitted the uh, project for serial development for serial production of these uh, sales. Uh, so about the uh, next um, important field use of bacterial pages is anything. So um, we have, we also in the um, area consortium have um, patent on the dissolved age, which is the bacterial age against the zoonotic infection, and these are the salmonella infection and the coag infection. So, we also had a lot of orders from the European, especially from German and uh, France, so because they had a big problem with first, is E. coli infection, salmonella, and enterocalis infection. So, um, we prepared a big product for them, and they very effectively using these phages and ferns to defeat uh, the antibiotic resistant bacterial strains of E. coli, salmonella, or uh, enterococcus this infection. Um, so I think that was very briefly about the um, experience and use of the bacterial phages in human health and animal protection. And um, since uh, 
uh, of the greeting was with us, I will say thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, dear participants, now we are going to eat because all of you are under stress. Yeah?